everybody. Hello. This is John here. This is Paul. George. And Ringo. And we're very happy to be on your program once again. Hello, everyone, and welcome to show number 78 of Beatle News Briefs. I'm your host, Steve Marinucci, and this is your home for all the news you need to know and the best talk from the Beatles world. Today we'll be talking with Charles Rosenay, the founder of Good Day Sunshine, and who I think you all know for his Beatle-related events, including his tribute concerts and his tours. Today, though, we'll be talking about the upcoming tribute, not to the Beatles, but to the Monkees and to his friend, the Monkees Peter Tork, which will be held in Connecticut on February 8th. We'll discuss his longtime friendship with Peter, and he'll give us some memories of being with him and, and what he was like. Here's our talk with Charles. Take a listen, and we'll have more after the interview, so don't go away. I'd like to welcome to Beetle News Brief my longtime friend, Charles Rosenay. Hello, Mr. Rosenay. Long time no talk to you. <laughs> Hi, Steve. So great to talk to you again. I know. I mean, I mean, it seems like it seems like we don't do this we don't do this often enough. And actually, today we're going to do something a little different. Charles has a an event coming up. Why don't you first tell tell the people what the event is? Well, it's a Monkeys Convention and Peter Tork Memorial event. Uh, you know, people who know how much I love the Beatles. Some also know that I've always been a huge, huge Monkees fan, and I've been very involved with Monkees fandom since the late 70s and early 80s, kind of a little after I started doing all the Beatles things. Um, but in 2013, we did a memorial Monkees convention for Davy Jones, and it was a big to-do, you know, three-day mm -hmm. uh, Meadow, Meadowlands, the 100 guests, that kind of thing. And I thought, you know, Peter Tork was from Connecticut. He was a friend of mine. February is the anniversary of his passing. It's also his birthday month. Uh, I thought it would be a shame to not do something. So we're putting together a, a very special, more homely, grassroots type of fan-friendly convention uh, for one day only, February 8th, uh, in Connecticut. I, I I can't remember if I knew that he was from Connecticut or not. I, I, I thought he was from California, but he 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 grew up in Connecticut. Is that it? Yeah, he lived in Connecticut most of his life. Uh, he passed in Connecticut. His family were all Connecticut. His dad was a University of Connecticut uh, professor. So yeah, that, Connecticut was definitely his roots. And he probably played more uh, shows. Probably California and Connecticut uh, are probably the two states that he did his most of his shows in, uh, non-monkeys, that is, when he wasn't touring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you had him as a guest at your events in the past. How many times did he guest for you? Well, so interestingly enough, he was a convention guest at my Beat Expo in 2009 at the Beatle at a Beatles convention. Mm -hmm. But way back in 1982, he was a guest at one of my early Monkees conventions, which was at a time when it was unheard of. I mean, no Beatle would ever be at a Beatle convention. No Monkey would be at a Monkees convention. But there he was. He was the first. And for years thereafter, Mickey and Davey and Peter and even Mike would, would actually appear at Monkey Convention. So he was the first to ever do that. And uh, it was in 1982 where we became close and we became close actually on stage steve because i was interviewing him for the convention and it was only about a half hour interview and we're talking about all the usual you know things monkeys this uh songwriting that the other guys and uh it was only a year and a half after we lost john lennon and the question came up about what was his feelings about the loss of john and we only had about four or five minutes left on the interview but that didn't stop it went on for about a half hour and no one has ever spoke as beautifully as eloquently as poignantly about john and how great that loss was and it, you couldn't you couldn't hear a pin drop in the room there were tears in the room it was just so uh, unbelievable and emotional I, from that point on i i was hooked i mean peter tork was you know, high high in my estimation of people. Did did I just to not to get away from Peter, but um, was Peter the only monkey that appeared at at your conventions? So he was the only one who appeared at um, the Beatle. Con no, no, we had Davy. 
also you in had the mid eighties. Oh wow! Yeah, we had Davy. Um, was a, was a very special guest, and uh, he was great. He came with his whole band, and uh, he knew the audience because uh, he did a three Beatles set right in the middle. <laughs> Um, and they were both unbelievable in that they would not, they didn't just perform, they weren't just interviewed, but they sat for hours. They literally waited till every single person got a, got an autograph. And that was in the days when people, when the celebrities didn't charge for autographs. Mm -hmm. When we had Peter years later at the Beatles uh, Expo in 2009, that was already when people were charging for autographs. And, you know, it was kind of a way to make sure they came to shows was to guarantee them, you know, a fee for, for signing autographs. Right. But in those days, yeah, it was just, just great to have them and they would come because, you know, they were, they were, they were you know, great with the fans. There, and, and you bring up an interesting point that I've noticed that you notice online is the – even though there's two left, even though it's just now Mickey and Mike – they connect with the fans, and they, I mean, Mike posts all the time. He just posted a lengthy, lengthy statement about his feelings about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yesterday, which, if you haven't seen it, is worth hunting down. Um, but, it's also fr but it's also frustrating for those who don't agree with him. <laughs> right, but did you, yeah. you saw the statement, I assume, did you? I, I do, and, and I see it, and I get it, and I understand it, and he's unfortunately correct but i still feel there's a place for a band that influenced so many new wave groups and influenced so many other musicians oh, I, and I, were so beloved i agree with you completely um uh i think you know i in talking i mean i've broached the subject with all four of them as you probably i mean you probably have with you know with with when you've met them um, I was lucky enough to talk to all four of them, and I've asked them all, and they all have this very standoffish kind of defensive posture. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're they're not there, and they don't feel like they can get there. And right. you know, basically, it's because of Jan Wenner, and because of that whole the way the whole scene is set up. And right. I th I think they would, I think you know, if they were to get in, they would be you know they would be very grateful i think they would they really would love to get in i think it's because they don't feel like they have a chance and i you know you can't blame them i mean they're really being excluded for no reason at all and it's really kind of, it's really kind of sad it's very sad and i think it meant the most to davy who's no longer with us so right. it's in a way a moot point um but the question is you know mickey dolan's one of the greatest pop rock vocalist in history mm -hmm. if he wasn't in a in a in a band the monkeys and he was a, a incredible solo artist who did hit after hit after hit would he be in the rock and roll hall of fame and then Mick, uh, mike nesmith you know a country pop music pioneer who wrote you know for the stone ponies linda ronstadt such great hits and put out such a, a wealth of that genre of music um, a la Poco or Nitty Gritty Dirt Band or Leonard Skinner or whoever came after him, would he be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as an artist if he wasn't a monkey? So those things, you know, kind of play, you don't even think about those aspects of it, and it's a greater picture. But as long as they're monkeys and as long as there's a young winner, there's not going to be monkeys in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Well, and, <laughs> and, and also to add about Nesmith is the elephant parts. You know his his vi course. his video so, pioneering too, and I right. believe he has Correct. I believe he has gotten awarded for that, and and you know mm -hmm. and right rightfully so, but yes. yeah it's just it's just really crazy it's it's crazy. Let's get back to Peter though. Um, he was, I mean he they had him playing the dummy, the, you know the real dumb guy. And yeah. and that was really, uh, you know, he was not dumb. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, he was he was he was very intelligent. When you talk to him, when you, uh, you know, when you talk to him, you know, face to face, he was he was very intelligent and extremely we can, intelligent. If we can take that a step further, in any given scenario, he was probably the most intelligent person in the room at the time. Hmm. And I think he knew. And I think he knew that as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, do you yeah have a, very do you, educated, very worldly, very opinionated, 
and yeah, just the opposite of the character he played in the show. Can you can you recall any specific incidents when you interviewed him uh, when you, at the conventions? Well, just I mean, his his uh, vocabulary was incredible. I mean, he was. I, I think he he actually at times of his life taught in college. I mean, he was a teacher. He was very very educated. But um, you know, we would talk about so many different subjects uh, off stage you know, when when he when he was at my Beatles con- Beatle Expo in two thousand and nine. Um, he was also really great. He went to some TV shows with me and actually did on-air promotions mm-hmm. where we both, you know, promoted the event. So we drove to the TV stations together back and forth, and we had a lot of time to chat. And, you know, sure, he gave me some of the, the, the gossip, you know. Yes, he had an affair with Janis Joplin. Uh, yes, he, you know. Oh, he, he did? He, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and yes, he did this, whatever. Um, but what was more interesting was... Yeah, how worldly, how, how what a historian he was, mm-hmm. how, what he knew about current affairs and, and, and past history and how educated he was. Just very, very impressive. And, and I think that, you know, having to play this, you know, kind of, you know, monkey his whole life, I think that, you know, might have might have irked him at some time, but he realized that it was his bread and butter and he realized it was his calling. Mm-hmm. And, and as far as uh, music goes, he was incredibly um uh knowledgeable of music i mean he he always played the banjo which which kind of looked a little crazy with the monkeys but that only really just showed you know how musically in tune he was i mean he was he had a lot of musical knowledge he was he was a very adept musician uh, not to yeah, say he's that he was a multi instrumentalist right. banjo bass, uh, harpsichord, a piano, keyboards, you know, on and on, and, you know, and, and he could play classical as well. And he hated being pigeonholed into playing, you know, I'm a Believer and all that because, you know, he, his favorite uh, music was blues. Right. And given, you know, given his, you know, choice, he would be out there with uh, a group he put together called uh, Shoe Suede Blues. Right. And, and, you know, play more of the rootsy, r- rockabilly blues music. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you have. I mean, actually, uh, there, there's another argument, you know, for their being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You have Mike, who had a career on his own before he, you know, before he joined the Monkees. You had Peter, who had a career on his own. You had Mickey, who, although he was basically known as an actor, also had musical had had some musical uh, experience. And you had Davy. Who was, who, who you know, who acted, uh, you know, who was in Oliver and, uh, and Broadway star. That's right, right. right. Yeah. So you know, you had. It wasn't like uh, the way they're, you know, that they were sometimes thought of as a completely bunch, of, you know, four guys with nothing who who just came aboard and act acted. They didn't. They were, well, you know, they well, were very, uh, they were all very talented. You know, well, the biggest the biggest argument, and we could probably I, I want to end with this because I don't want to dwell on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because it's very frustrating. Sure. But the Coasters are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The Drifters, these are great uh, vocal bands who didn't write their music, who didn't play any instruments, but they sang the songs. How is that different than the Monkees? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, yes, you're, you're you're right. Let's let's we'll end, we'll end that we'll end that there. Um, but anyway, getting getting back to Peter, I mean, uh, he was I I found him you know very very genial. Uh, uh, he was just a very nice guy. He really was. Yeah. Wasn't he? And 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 the uh, the one thing I was going to uh, and I started talking about the their connection with fans. I think you know there's a there's a, a definite difference between the connection that they have with their fans and the Beatles have with their fans. I mean, obviously, we're talking about two different things here. Leagues, two, yeah, yeah, two two different, two, uh, two, two different leagues. Right. But right, there is a <laughs> right, but there's a there's a very the monkeys even now 
uh, are, are I, I'm not sure that it was that way. In fact, I'm sure it wasn't that way, in, you know, in the late 60s. But now they're very down to earth with their fans. They talk, you know, they talk to them. Um, you know, there's yep. all sorts of media chances to meet them. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, and, and even communicate with them online because they're, you know, they're both very active on Facebook. Um, and Peter, Peter was, and, and Davey, you know, Davey was, uh, while he was still around. So yeah, that's, it's really, it's really great that, you know, uh, the way they've, they've interacted with their fans and their music is still, you know, great. And they've been, they've been, you know, working on, uh, there's been reissues and reissues and reissues. I mean, they've been making money with their reissues just like everybody else does, just like the Beatles do, just like, you know, everybody else is doing now, you know, so. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I thought it would have been remiss to not do, um, because we did such a very successful Davy Jones Memorial Convention in 2013. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I understand that Davy Jones was a much larger figure in the monkey's lore and had many, many more fans. You know, but to to not do something for Peter, uh, I think would have been unfair. And and we didn't need to do it on that larger of a scale, but we're doing something pretty special. And we've got a lot of bands, and we have special guests, and we have a memorabilia and and all the vendor stuff. But what's really neat is we're putting together a tribute at the end, a video memorial to Peter, and. Some really cool people have sent in videos already, and we just started, you know, asking out there, uh, Gary Puckett, Tommy James, Liberty DeVito, some of the people who played with uh, Peter, his drummer, F Felipe Torres, Sandy Gennaro, people who played with the Monkees and were friends with the Monkees have thrown together, you know, a one-minute clip, and we're assembling it all and putting together what, what's going to be uh, hopefully a very... A heartfelt, very warm and moving tribute to Peter, which will probably be the climax of the convention. Who are some of the uh, tribute groups that are going to be playing there? Well, the headliner are the Blue Meanies, who have uh, pretty much played a bunch of the conventions, uh, and uh, you know, pretty much from the past few years, mm -hmm. including the Davy Jones Memorial, both at the convention and also at BB King's in New York. Uh, they're kind of the go-to Monkees tribute band. They're from Staten Island and New Jersey. Then we have a group called Zilch, who are uh, more like a high-energy, younger, real up-tempo up, uh, Monkees band that doesn't just play the hits, but the deeper cuts, the B-sides, mm, uh, okay. the album tracks. Um, Mick Lawless, Loose Salute, is... Um, it was originally a Nesmith tribute band, and what he does is he kind of country versions the monkey songs, and he's going to be there. <laughs> and uh, oh, the opening act is John Sheridan, who, believe it or not, was the only musical act who used to play in the days before monkey tribute bands, back in the late 70s when the conventions first started in New Jersey, um, by a gal named Maggie McManus, oh, who yes. published the monkey business fanzine he was the musical act it was john sheridan and his guitar doing monkey songs and uh he, he's we brought him back and so we're really happy that he's you know, after all these years coming back to do his show it, uh, it sort of brings things full circle and uh those are the pretty much the four musical acts we're working on someone else who hasn't been um confirmed yet uh, but you know, those are the ones who are in place, and it's a real a variety of, of musical choices. It's, it's the regular cover band, the high-energy one, the country version, and then the solo uh, kickback. <laughs> Maggie McManus, there's a, there's a great name from the past. Is she going to be there? I hope so. We, we certainly invited her. This is what I'm going for. When, when Maggie uh, used to do the conventions in New Jersey, and... It was in a time when the monkeys w w had no respect. Right. And, you know, there was, this was before the 86 reunion, before mm -hmm. MTV, before that was then, this is now, before the Renaissance. Um, and the only people who went were the 50 or 100, you know, true diehard fans who showed up at the Trenton War Memorial <laughs> and, you know, watched Head together, bought, you know, the Cold Gem albums, and pretty much heard John Sheridan play. Uh, to, 
1982, I said, Maggie, let's bring this to another level. I was doing the Beatle conventions by then, and I, I had a little more expertise and uh, a little larger of a show. And, she, you know, she and I combined forces. We brought the show to Connecticut, and that's where Peter Tork was, our special guest. We did it again the next year uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, and brought in Bill Chadwick, who was a Beatles producer. He, I'm sorry, the Monkees producer. Mm -hmm. um, wrote, a song, wrote a song or two for the Monkees, was a close friend of theirs, and really brought it up, you know, from 50 or 100 people to a few hundred people. And then, um, you know, jump ahead to 86, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, every, everywhere you look, it's the Monkees. The Monkees at Disneyland, and, and they're on mm -hmm. the charts again. All that was very, very exciting. We did a convention that Maggie was not quite involved with. It was in 87, and it was called the National Monkeys Convention. And it was very, very special, um, Steve, because it was Mickey, Peter, Davey, and Boyce and Hart. Wow. All at one convention. Which wow. was Yeah, that was so historic. And um, shortly after that, Maggie kind of dropped out. She stopped publishing her magazine and sort of, you know, led a normal life, so to speak. Which what was, it, what was the name of her magazine? I was going to ask you about her magazine. What was the name of her magazine? I Monkey's can... Business Fanzine. Okay, because I remember seeing that, and and, that's, and, and uh, it seems to, I, I may have some of those issues somewhere, but I, I do remember that. It, and that's it, where, it, where, it, was the, it was the Bible for monkey fans. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, it, the way I said, saw it, you know, you have Good Day Sunshine if you're a Beatles fan, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have Monkey's Business Fanzine if you're a Monkey's mm -hmm. fan, and, and that covers it. But um, Maggie was great. She kept the spirit and the music, and she kept the monkeys alive for the fans for the years where it was dark and bleak and there really was no contact. Right. Don't forget, you know, there, there was no internet. There was no way to keep in touch. There was no way to real, and she would, you know, get the, the fanzine out every other month. She did an unbelievable job. You can't say enough about Maggie McManus's contribution to Monkey's fandom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was. She was, a, she was a, a real pioneer as far as that goes, as, as were you. Um, but, uh, I hope she shows up for you. I, I, I do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's great that, that, um, that, uh, the, that you're doing this tribute to him. He, he definitely deserves it. And it was, it was great to see after he passed the great outpouring of love, you know, among, not only among monkey fans, but, you know, the public in general who got to know him through the show. Um, yes. He really, yeah, they really, there was really this big, um, you know, this, like I said, this big love thing, uh, and he deserved it. You know, it's too bad that it 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 kind of didn't really happen that much while he was alive, although, you know, the, the way the, the monkeys um, promoted themselves in the past few years, they have gotten you know, more love and they've, they've pushed themselves hard, especially with the out, al you know, with the album, um, or I should say albums that they've put out, um, the new albums. And they've been great. They put out, um, the good time album was amazingly great, great mm -hmm. pop stuff, uh, you know, right up there with the best of the early monkey stuff and their Christmas album is really solid. I mean, it's a great album. Mm -hmm. You know, Unwrap You for Christmas is, is, you know, one of Mickey's gems. And if people haven't heard either one of them, they really should check them out. They'd be surprised. Yeah, they, they those albums are really, are really, really good. They're really, really good. And, and uh, you know, they've continued, uh, uh, especially Mickey, uh, uh, um, well, both Mickey and Mike have have been putting out new new music, actually newer and old music. Um, Mike's been yeah. doing a lot of reissue stuff and putting out uh, old concerts that haven't been out before, and um, and 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 Mickey's been, you know, I think he's got a, a, another show on Broadway coming up, but he's been doing a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff uh, over the years. Yeah, very so, true. Yeah. yeah, they've they've definitely been keeping it going. Um, am I? Uh, would I? Be wrong to ask you if there will be a monkey at your convention. So there won't. Um, we we actually um, unfortunately planned the event a uh, long time ago on this particular date. Mickey had a uh, um, Arizona. He's doing the symphony show oh, okay. where he's playing with a whole symphonic orchestra mm -hmm. in Arizona on the same date. 
So no, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you, we've got some interesting guests okay. who've never been at any kind of event like this before, and they're pretty obscure. So a true fan, you know, is, is who, who knows Peter's history and has probably followed the different variations of his bands will be pleased that we've gotten uh, Reinhard Straub, who is the electric violinist in the New Monks. Oh my God! Be one of our guests. Yeah, he played on um, Stepping Stone and Higher and Higher, which was the 1981 New Monks single. He also toured with them. Uh, he's going to be there. Um, a gal named Wendy Erdman, who was friends with the Torkelsons from birth. I mean, she was pretty much uh, friends of the Tork family growing up. Mm -hmm. They grew up together. She became a singer, recorded an album, and sure enough, Nick, who was Peter's brother, and oops. Okay, we're back after a a technical disruption here. Um, you were you were you were giving us the you were given the name of your guest. So go ahead and start. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and start that start that again, Charles? Well, Steve. So, um, like the earliest conventions where we try to find pretty much obscure people who um, true fans would know about mm -hmm. if you followed Peter Torx career uh he had different bands through the years besides the monkeys and in 1981 uh it was peter tork and the new monks mm -hmm. and they put out some singles they recorded they toured and uh his electric violinist by the name of reinhard straub we dug him up <laughs> and we uh, saw that his name was sure enough on the credit for the 45 okay. uh, step in stone higher and higher we invited him He's coming, and he was a friend of Peter's and actually went through AA with Peter together and has a lot of great stories to tell. But, uh, but he played live with him and recorded with him, and he's one of our guests. Another guest is uh, a gown by the name of Wendy Erdman. Wendy was a friend of the Torkelsons growing up. Mm -hmm. She was a, from, from birth. Uh, her and Peter and, the, and Peter's family grew up together, celebrated birthdays together. Turns out she became a singer and recorded an album in around 1970. And both Peter and his brother Nick recorded on that album. So uh, her, her album uh, called a self-titled Wendy Erdman, they're both on that album. It's a real rarity if anyone wants to Google that. She's coming. She's one of our guests. And another guest uh, so far over the three we've gotten so far is uh, Danny G, who was Peter Tork's sound man for the Peter Tork Project. It was around 83 where uh, Jerry Renino uh, brought the Peter Tork Project to Danny's studio to rehearse these guys. The band solidified. Danny recorded some of their tunes. He went on the road with them. He actually wound up going to uh, Japan with them and then became a drummer and played with the band. So uh, Danny G, whose real name is Danny G. Orlando, has a lot of great stories to tell about the Peter Tork Project and going to Japan and all that, and he's our other guest. So um, those are the three guests so far, and we have a few in the pipeline that we hope we're going to sign before the actual convention. Okay. And the convention is what date? It's Saturday, February 8th. It's in North Haven, Connecticut, at the Best Western Plus Hotel. Uh, hours are 1 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Uh, we have a VIP early bird noon opening for you know the real serious collectors who want to get in before everybody else and get their first pickings with the vendors. Okay. And how do people get tickets? Um, they go to www.monkeysfanconvention.com. Or they can call us at 203-795-4737. But I think it's easier to remember the website, which is monkeysfanconvention.com. There's a link to the tickets. Uh, it's got all the information about the event. And we sure hope a lot of people come uh, to, to, just to support the memory of Peter Tork, the, the, the music, the, the life of Peter, and just uh, enjoy the monkeys' music together with fellow fans. Is there anything that um, that we that I didn't ask you about that you wanted that you want to mention uh, as far as the the show goes? Yeah, um, when Peter passed uh, on his website, the family, the Torkelson family, indicated that um, they have a, 
a family charity called the IMA, which mm-hmm. is the Institute for uh, Music in uh, Massachusetts. And we uh, contacted them, and we decided that the that would also be the beneficiary of the convention itself. Oh, cool. So um, not only do a portion of proceeds from tickets benefit the IMA, but we're having a charity auction, and part of that charity auction um, will benefit the IMA as well. And um, the tor- tor- Peter Tork's family um, ha- is going to actually be selling some items at the convention, including Peter's original upright piano. Oh, really? So it's a lot of a lot of really exciting stuff. Yeah. Wow, that's it's that's that should be a headline that's there. Pretty special. Yeah, yeah, that is pretty special. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you for mentioning that. Okay, um, Charles, this has been been fun, and um, uh, since this is a Beatles show, we should yeah. probably do a, a a little mention about your Beatles your Beatles tours. Um, When's the next one? Great. (laughs) (laughs) When's the next one? When's the next one? (laughs) We do it every single summer during Beatles Week, which is in August. Right. And we're having it August 24th to September 2nd, where we go to London and Liverpool. We also do a side trip to Henley to visit George's home, and um, this is uh, we've been doing this going on close to 40 years of bringing thousands and thousands of fans over to the Beatles' homeland, visiting all their, uh, every every place you could imagine, you know, whether it's, whether you've seen it in the books, whether you've read about it, whether you've seen it on postcards or heard it in the songs from, you know, Penny Lane to Strawberry Field Mm -hmm. to Abbey Road. We we do it all. And what's best is we do it as a group. Um, So you're with fellow fans, you're safe, and you just have the greatest time. And if anyone wants to join us, it's so simple, liverpooltours.com. And I appreciate you including that because as much as I love the monkeys and I'm holding my hand as high as I can, well, I hold the Beatles up a little higher because, mm-hmm. you know, again, a different league and a different planet, of course. Yeah. You and I, we should we should tell the personal story. You, you and I have only, I believe we've only run into each other once, correct? Right. And yes. that was in Las Vegas to see Paul McCartney at the joint. At the joint, and at, and that was that was not only was that a spectacular show, it was loud. My it ears are st- my ears are still ringing from that thing. I mean, and it was a <laughs> tiny little room, and he had the, yeah. he had the amps turned up all the way. Yeah, he had them as high as if as if <laughs> as if he was at uh, an outdoor sixty thousand venue. Yeah, place. he re- yeah. he really did. He really did, and it, it was a wonderful show. I've have not seen uh, uh, a soundboard recording of that floating around, but I have seen some audience recordings floating around, and and it it was fun. That was that was Great. a lo- that was a lot of fun. We had we were I remember we were standing in the kind of in the middle there, weren't we? Right in front of the right near the soundboard. That's exactly where we were. Right, it was a great venue and a great night. And Very we were—I mean, I mean, we were—I mean, we could see him really well, and there were people like right underneath him. You know, I mean, they were, you know, touching within, you know, they could reach out their hands and shake his hand. I mean, they were that close to him. He was, he was right there, you know. It was, it was amazing. Um, that was. Uh, I know we couldn't talk, we couldn't talk during the show, but we talked before and after. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, we, we, <laughs> All we, we did, did was stand, stand and smile and watch it and love it. Yeah. It was, that was, uh, that was one show I will, I will not forget. It was, uh, it was fantastic. And even now, I mean, you have to, you know, I mean, you, the years have gone by and he's gotten older, but there's still this magic. I mean, you you could say what you want about, you know, about certain aspects of the show now and, and you know, and some people usually do, but the magic is still there. And, I, you know, right. and it, it's amazing because when I saw him in San Jose last summer, you know, you sit there and you wait, and and the lights go down, and he comes on the stage, and it's, and and it's like there's this rush that, that goes through you. It's like you're looking at Paul McCartney, and Paul McCartney it's is Paul looking McCartney. at you, and he's and he, he was trying, you know, and in 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 that big, you know, this was inside the uh, San Jose, um, um, I can't remember, they've changed the name, um, arena. 
and um, you know that's a big place. But he was yeah. he was you know looking at all sorts of people and pointing, and he was doing his best trying to to you know trying to interact with the crowd, and he was, and that's and it's amazing. It's it's amazing that he still does that. But in any yeah. way, anyway, I was gonna I, I, just to get back to the Beatle tours. We should do a whole thing on on the Beatle tours and and the stories from the Beatle tours. But I have to ask you, you said you go you go by George's house. What has what has we, happened when you when you go by George's house? Well, so we go to Henley, right. which is where his home is. Right. We don't enter his house because it's um, it's a because, gigantic right. estate mm-hmm. which is gated, right. um, which we go to. But we. What what happens is when you go to London mm-hmm. and you go to Liverpool, you're going to New York, you're going to L.A., you're going to Chicago, you're going to giant metropolitan cities, which right. are, you know, massive. And we want to give people who come on the tour a taste of a quaint British village, which is what George loved about Henley. Mm-hmm. So we go to the town, we stop at the pub where he drank, we visit the church where Dusty Springfield across the street uh, where her ashes are oh, and we go and we go through the town so that's the magic of Henley but of course the highlight is going up to his estate which is Friar Park which he affectionately called Cracker Box Palace right and we go up to the gate we can leave a uh, light a candle we can leave flowers in the past you know uh, gardeners have come out and either greeted us or thrown us away but we do pay our res- <laughs> but we do pay our respects and we see the front um building which is sort of a miniature version of the giant mansion that's further on inside which you don't have access to right well if we yeah. if we if, when we do we need to do a a show about the stories from the tour and your and, and your and your encounters with the Beatles, um, and, definitely, and there have been some, correct? Yeah, some amazing stories. <laughs> yep. Well, well, we'll 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 put that on the list, and we'll do that at some point. Charles, this has been fun. Good luck so with fun. good luck with the monkeys convention, and and folks, if you are in the area or you can get to the area, go to that go to that Peter Tork tribute on February eighth. Um, and it, it it sounds like it'll be a great time. So, thank you so much, Steve. You're welcome, Charles. We hope you enjoyed that interview. Charles mentioned during the discussion we had that Peter Tork had appeared at his Beat Expo in 2009. If you've ever heard Peter interviewed, you know he had a very wry sense of humor. Here are a couple of examples of that. First is a brief audio clip of Peter at Beat Expo talking about both the Beatles and the Monkees, and it shows how much respect he had for both the Fabs and the Monkees. <laughs> this, uh, uh, this next song is, a, is was on the B-side of um, the first single put out by that group <laughs> who followed the group we are honoring tonight. Uh, yes, we were the prefab four. <laughs> I never get tired of that joke. It's funnier all the time. Um, and um, well, I do have been so, you know. I mean, we really, in some ways, the thing that I treasure the most is that we swept the, um, the, the spirit of the times into television, into and through television. Yeah. And we were glad, yeah. lucky to see that. I'm, I'm a lot, I'm very conversant with those songs. I'm going to do another song from that group to which I used to belong, which will remain anonymous. Monkeys no. Anonymous, a 12 step group for recovering. <laughs> Hi, my name is Peter, I'm a recovering. <laughs> 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 I'm with friends of Bill's and Lois's and whoever else. Hi, Peter. Okay, this uh, is a ver- different version from the from the way it appears on the on the B side of the single. Um, I don't know why. I just it's just the way I, I wound up uh, doing it. I- if you hadn't guessed, he was talking about the song "Take a Giant Step." That was the one he was about to perform. Next is a portion of a TV interview that uh, Peter and Charles did to promote that 2009 Beat Expo. 
that Charles mentioned in the interview. And here, Peter talks more about the Beatles and the monkeys, and they're looking at images during the taping of the interview, and that's what they're referring to. Hey, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an idol to Beatles fans because I shook their hand. That's you know, something. That's it's something in my life, I'm telling you that much. I've <laughs> never washed it again. Um, the uh, flu. It's a little too um, late, I think. Yeah, oh. all right. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I'm a, yeah, I was a total Beatles fan. Uh, uh, the whole thing about, uh, I was a folky when they were uh, first exploding on the scene. I thought, man, that looks like a lot of fun. And, and such it has proved to be, actually, I have to say. Uh, as, uh, you know, when I, to the extent that I've shared their experience, it's been an awful lot of fun. Look at them. Don't they look like they're having fun? Wrong answer. <laughs> at that very moment, yeah, maybe no, not. Maybe not. Yeah, right. But you talk about the, the, this British invasion thing certainly had an impact on your career as a oh, man. The, yeah, the, the whole 60s thing, uh, the Monkeys TV show, as everybody pretty much knows, was a uh, television version <clears throat> of the Beatles' Hard Day's Night. Uh, a little, meant to be a little irreverent, uh, a little anarchic. Um, and it succeeded maybe beyond its wildest dreams. Oh, look, our album covers. I've never seen those before. Um, and, uh, uh, and we were very lucky to catch the same wave sure. after the Beatles sort of let go of it. You know, that wave kept going, and we said, we'll take it, thanks a lot, and uh, off we went. Um, it was, uh, oh, man, I can't believe those silly people. Look at that screen. Yeah, but we're lovable silly people. And finally, here's a clip of an interview we did with Peter in 2013 where he talks about the Beatles as he knew them with a special focus on his friendship with Ringo. Do you have any anecdotes about them that you could say? Well, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll tell you one of my favorites is mm -hmm. post, post Beatles. Uh, Mickey Davy and I did a commercial with Ringo Starr. Oh, it yes. Was, it was a pizza, a pizza Hut commercial, I think. Right. Ringo goes around saying, uh, it's time up to the lads. It's time to eat your pizza crust first. Mm -hmm. So they put cheese in the crust for a little while. That was their riff. And right. the monkeys come up and he, says, he looks, at the, looks at the audience as wrong lads. And, hey, Ringo, it's like pretty good, pretty good stuff, Ringo. How you doing, pal? <laughs> and it's pretty wacko. And we were shooting the, the commercial. And one section, Ringo's sitting at his drums and we're just... They're working on the shot. The cameraman's doing some talking with the director. And we're just standing there. And Ringo says something droll. And I said, Ringo, you're just a musician. We're the comedians. We'll do the humor. Ringo said, I've been funny. People have laughed at me jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, that, that, that's, that's typical. He's um, very droll. He is actually, uh, he's, he's, Grant, I've, uh, I've, uh, we've, we've had occasion for our paths to cross on a couple of occasions. And uh, he's always, when I met them all at the first occasion, John and Paul and George met Mickey and me and I think one of the others of us, I can't remember for sure. And Ringo wasn't there. And uh, George the next day took me to Ringo's house. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I will tell you that I think of the four of them, Ringo has and remains the one with the least agenda. He just, just you know, he, he deals with his life as he finds it. He doesn't have a, a, an idea of what's supposed to be or what who he's supposed to be or any of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. The other three do, did, to, to a much greater extent anyway. Ringo's always been the most human as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Anyway, that's, um, that's my story. That's the best story I got for the moment. And here's a little bit of news. Variety reported on... January 28th, that a preview of Peter Jackson's reboot of Let It Be was recently shown in L.A. The audience was asked not to film or photograph the segment, which was introduced by Apple Records chief Jeff Jones. Jim Aswad of Variety quoted Jones as saying, We have created a brand new film that will attempt to bust the myth that the Let It Be sessions were the final nail in the Beatles' coffin. Variety noted that the preview showed clips that were brighter both visually and spiritually, to use their word, with many, many shots of the Beatles joking around, making fun of each other, and singing in silly accents, and generally indulging in vintage mop-top hijinks. The film also includes scenes of the Beatles in previously unreleased song clips 
of what would become the Abbey Road album. And just for a couple of whispers, our sources are telling us to look for a Ravi Shankar live in Copenhagen release and that the upcoming Flaming Pie Box will have extras in the UMS store. So, and it also looks like there will be a McCartney Record Store Day release coming in April. Our very, very special thanks to Charles Rosenay for being such a great guest on today's show. Thank you, Charles. And that's it for today. Remember, you can find our shows on the great Fab Four Radio, iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. Look for our Beatle News and Information group on Facebook and join us. Also check out our That's What I Want Beatles store page on Facebook for great deals for yourself or your favorite Beatle fan and links to my ebook Mina Monkey Davy Jones and Candy Leonard's Beatleness. And if you like us, please subscribe to this podcast. We'll be looking forward to seeing you next time. Till that next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying Be seeing you. that one market fab what a show